son? Yeah. Former candidate, Dan Ryder. <laughs> One, uh, uh, let James Valente, who is chair of the Brattleboro. Uh, he's the other guy with the red shirt. Uh, Tristan, we are introducing candidates and members. Please stand. So we also got a round of applause for great food. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> and he above his desk he and I were called special emphasis workers that's what we were don't ask me why and he had a sign above his desk that said s period e period w period e period r sewer and I said what on earth is sewer and he said it stands for special emphasis worker emphasizing revolution <laughs> so, we got to be pretty close friends in Connecticut. We then, my husband and I went off to graduate school and we lost track of each other. And a couple, a few years later, um, David came to visit us and he said, I don't know what I'm going to do this summer. I'm in Chicago, I'm bartending, what am I going to do? And we said, why don't you move to Vermont? And he said, okay, so I figure if I never do anything for Vermont again, I brought him here. <laughs> so he came here with his kids for the summer, and we had bought some land on Windmill Hill in Western West, and we were going to build a house. David and his two kids lived on the land not in a house, not even in a tent. They had a, some tarps and some uh, poles and some cloths and an American flag, if I remember. <laughs> and um, they lived there all summer. So then David went on to become the director of SEVCA. And since then, he's been active in democratic politics and in promoting the democratic agenda. And all that was told to you by way of now introducing the recipient of the Ron Squires Award, David. Uh, Superstar, and um, um, so I really honored. We weren't quite as rehearsed as, as we thought. Okay. Now I'm going to um, give regrets from um, 
Peter Shumlin, who cannot be here, who, as you probably know, is running for governor again. <laughs> but, and he wishes he could be here, but he cannot. And also from Cassandra Gikas, who is running for lieutenant governor and is unable to be here. So, uh, <clears throat> this may be a little easier. Um, <laughs> well, what, am I going to tell him that yeah, we should have that he should? We, the, 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 we're not, because politicians can never keep to this short amount of short speeches, we're not letting all the candidates speak, but we, <laughs> but we are allowing um, the statewide candidates to say something. So we'll take turns introducing them. And okay. Um, First, I would like to introduce uh, the can our candidate for Auditor of Counts, uh, Doug Offer. Oh. Um, and while he's making his way up here, uh, even his own political uh, advertising says that he's a numbers geek, uh, which is what we want for Auditor. And I want to add something personal. You do not want Vince Aluzzi as Auditor. Count your fingers. You heard that? Uh, yeah. So, in terms of the responsibility for holding government accountable, really ought to be in Doug's hands. One was the Peace and Justice Center, right. which engaged me to do what was called the, the Job Job Study. And the first one of those, you may recall, really introduced the concept of the little wage. Uh, and I think it's fair to say, changed the discourse about wages. And I'm very proud of what resulted from that, which is several increases in the minimum wage, uh, an increase in the annual tax credit, and that has helped tens of thousands of working Vermonters. In addition, another report uh, we did during that series was called the Leaky Bucket. And that was an effort to quantify the state's dependence better okay, yeah. uh, on imported goods and services. The goal was to identify strategic opportunities for import substitution. It sounds wonky and it is, but the goal was very simple. The buy local that we hear all the time is intended to uh, have us produce more of the goods and services we consume. From that, we get jobs, tax revenues, and a multiplier effect. And that report, I'm pleased to say, really provided the intellectual foundation for some work that has blossomed since then, including something you may know about called the Farm to Plate Program, among others. Yes. So uh, I've enjoyed that work. But the other early client was, in fact, Ed Flanagan when he was the state owner. He asked me to come uh, and work for him under contract, and I did. And the timing was uh, was ideal because it was at that time that a group called the Government County Standards Board was encouraging state auditors, public government auditors, to go beyond the traditional number counting and tracking to do something called performance audit, which is really very straightforward conceptually. And that is to look at programs created by state government to determine if, in fact, they are achieving the goals intended by the legislature. Fairly important. The legislature itself doesn't have the means to do that. The administration, various administrations, uh, often don't commit the resources to do that, and certainly not objective what they do. So that was an important role for the state auditor. I did some of that at the 15 years ago, and as it turned out, I had a map for that. I'm good at it. Um, so it was So uh, I've done a number of, of, of uh, projects in that vein, and I've, I've provided a lot of policy guidance to uh, policy makers in Montpelier, mostly related to economic development and related to tax policy. And my congressman, uh, as a beneficiary, made that put it. 
he received many of my messages. But I also worked quite a bit with my opponent, who is currently the chair of the Public Office Committee in the Senate. Uh, hundreds of hours pro bono for him. We didn't always get it done, and we didn't always agree, but at least he was open minded about the input. I'll give it back. That's fair. But I, I bring some things to the task that are spot on. For example, I have a talent for identifying and asking tough questions, which is critical for a auditor. I have a passion for challenging conventional wisdom. And those two alone get you into trouble and sometimes upset very powerful interests. But you know, as the Speaker of the House said the, the other day, I was at the event in Waterbury, and he was introducing people. He said, you know, he could be a pain in the ass. But he meant it really. It touched me. <laughs> because he, he meant that he, he understands that people in his position, in, in the administration, they're doing the best they can. They're, they're doing 12 things at once. But it's not common for them to do what the auditor can and must do for them, which is to provide independent and objective analysis about some of the work they do. So I was kind of pleased that he said that. In, in fact, two years prior, Gay Simonson said the same thing at a fundraiser at house. So I guess it's getting around. But, uh, and the other thing is, and this, this comes out of my early work with the job gap study, some of those issues were controversial. And if you're going out into the world with the legislature and, and, and promoting these things, as my good friend Brian Taylor did at the time, you better have the numbers right. Because if you don't, the opposition is going to bury you before you even get the first page out. So it was drilled into me early on that the facts have to speak for themselves. You don't go beyond the facts, and these are evidence-based findings, which is critical for the auditor's office. So I believe this, I live it, I enjoy it, and uh, you know, the auditor's office, to be honest, I think has been drifting a bit the last few years. They're not terribly well focused, and I bring a lot to the job. I think I have a unique uh, good skill set for this job, and I hope you'll help me get there. I really appreciate it. So he's been living the um, foundations of democracy for a long time, and that's that's his basis. Um, Jim Condo. Thank you. I'm not sure I need this because I think my voice carries pretty well anyway. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the support that I've gotten over the over the last two years, but especially two years ago, uh, to put me in this office. This is for me the the perfect job. Uh, brings together a lot of different factors of my experience, my background. Uh, I have about 30 plus years in, in, in uh, private sector business. Uh, part of that was for a regulated utility. Another 17 years of that was was for a uh, uh, Fortune 100 company. Uh, but I also have uh, over 20 years of elected service, as, as Jeanette started to say. Uh, I served 18 years on my city council. Eight of those years I was the chair. I served eight years in the state senate, and, and I was chair of the uh, government operations committee, which obviously uh, oversees the secretary of state's office. Two years ago, uh, actually it was now four years ago, right after uh, President Obama was elected, I was on an airplane going down to see my parents in Florida, and. Uh, Deb Markwitz was on the plane with me, and we were sitting together, and she said, you ought to think about running for my office because I'm not going to run in two years. And I said, well, I'll think about it, Deb, but I really wasn't at that point too serious about it. And then, as I say, the rest is history. I've really enjoyed my two years. I've really uh, have focused on a lot of different things. Just so you know what, what my office actually does. Uh, the first thing is the Vermont State Archives and Records Management Unit. Uh, under Jeanette's leadership, uh, they combined the two units together uh, about four years ago. And we built a state-of-the-art facility for the state archives. Uh, Greg, Greg Sanford was our state archivist for 30 years. Uh, and Greg uh, brought, it, brought it to uh, uh, where it is today. And, and the great news is, uh, for Greg anyway, that he retired uh, in August. And uh, I asked him at the time that he was retiring if he would please pick a corner of the vault to put his bed in because that's where he was going to be living after this. Uh, he is an art, he's, a, he's a treasure for the state of Vermont as well. Um, the other two, there's four, four total units that I oversee. Archives is one, 
The next one is the Office of Professional Regulation. In the Office of Professional Regulation, there are 45 professions like uh, engineers, nurses, um, accountants, whatever. We have 45 professions. They license 55,000 people. Uh, and our job is to oversee the licensing programs, work with the legislature and, and Genetics Committee on the scope of practice that each of those uh, licensing groups has. But also, we have the investigative and prosecutor, prosecutorial phases of overseeing those, those uh, professions. Uh, so that's, we work with that uh, on a, really every, that's the biggest unit I have. That, that's 38 out of my 68 people. Um, the third unit is the Corporations Division. The Corporations Division is where business goes to sign up, to register, to file liens. Uh, lawyers and, and banks use us every day, probably several times a day. Uh, and if you want to do business in the state of Vermont, you need to register your business with, with our, our uh, office. Um, the last one, of course, I think is one everybody is familiar with, and that's elections. Uh, we we manage the elections for the state of Vermont. Uh, we work with the 246 hardworking town clerks that we have, uh, and, and our job is to make sure that our elections are fair, accurate, and, and that we hopefully get every eligible vote to come out and vote. Uh, and that's my goal is to, is to continue to expand our eligibility, unlike many of my colleagues across the country who are actually right now uh, in the process of trying to suppress the vote uh, as we go. Um, we are fortunate here in Vermont. We have, first of all, we have uh, stopgap measures like Jeanette White. Uh, we won't let bad things happen. <laughs> but um, we, we, uh, we really are fortunate that uh, we have a very vibrant uh, electorate and that uh, people are really uh, conscious of what we do here. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is bring my business background, which is the technology and process side, and, make, and mesh it with the, with the government side. And we've been doing that. For instance, in corporations, we just signed a contract. Right now, uh, every January, or every other January, no, every January, what am I saying? We have 30 to 40,000 annual reports that come in to our office, a piece of paper with a check on it attached to it. Um, we're gonna automate that. That should be automated by January of this year. Um, we, in the Office of Professional Regulation, I, as I said, we have 55,000 license holders. When they knew, renew their license, when I first took, talked in the office, there was a stack of paper like this with a check attached to each piece of paper. Uh, and I said, what's that? And they said, well, that's the license renewals. And I said, well, why don't we do it online? Well, we don't have the capability of doing that. We are now doing that online. 90% of it's being done online. Uh, our next phase is going to be looking at the whole elections and campaign finance and, and lobbyist disclosure. I'll be working with Jeanette and Donna Sweeney to use the crap and language that we need to move that forward. Uh, but to, it's, it's important from the, the campaign finance and the lobbyist disclosure is important because uh, it, we need to know where the money's coming from and how it's being spent. And that's what, what the disclosure will provide for us, and I intend to make that as, as uh, transparent as possible. And the last thing I'll just talk about is the work that the legislature did uh, on transparency. They, they updated uh, the access to public records, which was uh, hadn't been updated really in 40 years. Uh, they finally did that, and I went out on my transparency tour to talk about transparency open meetings, and access to public records. I went around the state to 12 different sites. Actually, it ended up being 14 at the time. Uh, but 12 different sites were scheduled that where no town was more than an hour away from at least two sites, so that nobody had an excuse as to why they couldn't be there. We, we went out and we had 35 to 40 people at most of those uh, locations. And this spring, I was asked to come back to uh, St. Johnsbury. They have some of those issues going on up there. Uh, and I went back up there and was shocked to see the room full with 165 people. Um, but we are really clear about our mission, which is to explain transparency and how important the open meetings are and how important that, uh, the access to public records are. Uh, and, and I will continue that effort uh, going forward. So thank you very much. Hope I have your vote.
yeah, he did everything he said, but he's done something really important in my world, the water world, uh, clean water world, and that is to set up the first uh, citywide stormwater utility. Now, that won't mean much to you, but it helps keep the waters in South Burlington clean. Important step, and he took it as the leader just within his own community. Um, so, one other uh, thank you, uh, and that is for the chair of our county committee, uh, Bill Johnson, who uh, beyond everybody else who's helped out, He's uh, been keeping everybody on task and making this happen this evening. So. And now I would like to introduce Attorney General Bill Sorrell, who uh, many of you know or know his record. Uh, I know him, that he is a fly fisherman. <laughs> And many of the uh, times when I go to speak to uh, the Central Vermont chapter of Trout Unlimited, Bill is there. So he is also, uh, as all to yours are, an advocate for clean water. And I appreciate that about him. Bill. say when it comes to fly fishing, I'm more avid than accomplished. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I've been campaigning since March, uh, and as you know, uh, I had a very spirited and tough uh, primary campaign this past spring and, and, and summer. I want to thank the Democrats from Wyndham County. You showed me such strong support. I would not be the Democratic nominee for AG without the support I got out of this county. So thank you so much. I am very proud of my record as a very strong defender of a cleaner environment, uh, aggressive uh, criminal justice prosecution statewide, strong consumer protection advocate, stand up, I've stood up both in Vermont and nationally on civil rights issues. And I've got great energy uh, to continue to hold this wonderful office. And I think one of the real benefits of this primary is that a lot of Vermonters have a better appreciation for how profoundly the Attorney General affects the lives of average Vermonters and the quality of our environment. And I just want to say that it makes a real difference who is the Attorney General. And I won't go on with a whole litany of differences, but I'll just mention two, one in-state and one nationally, very significant differences between me and my Republican opponent. I'm pleased to say that yesterday, the Federal Appeals Court in New York City, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, handed down uh, a decision against the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. <laughs> and I'm pleased and proud to say that Vermont and New York uh, drafted a brief that the state of Connecticut signed on to against uh, the federal statute. We filed it at the Second Circuit. It now appears that the U.S. Supreme Court will take up uh, this case. And uh, today, in the final AG's candidate debate on NPR, my Republican opponent would not say what position he would put Vermont in before the U.S. Supreme Court on this issue. Make no mistake, if I am the Attorney General, Vermont will be arguing in the U.S. Supreme Court that all Vermonters who are married are entitled to equal rights under yes. federal law. Finally, let me say on an in-state matter. If I remain Attorney General come January, I am going to continue the fight against Entergy Corporation and to uphold the law against our legislature's say on the continued operation of the Vermont Yankee Plan. So 
again, in closing, I want to thank all of you who supported me through the primary, and those of you who chose not to support me. I respect uh, your right to, to choose on that. But let me say that I need your support on November 6th, and I hope I'll have the support of all Wyndham County Democrats, and I'll be able to continue to serve you as your Attorney General come January. Thank you. Very much. is not a political position. It is responsible for the state's investments. It's responsible, it's a bank for the state agencies. It's responsible for issuing bonds. And it's responsible for the retirement funds of the state. And under Beth's, she was the assistant treasurer before. And she, when Doug talked about being a geek, Beth really is. She, she knows more about investments. I, half the time, can't even understand what she's talking about, but she is so, she is not a political being. And I'll tell you, I could, as a Democrat, of course I'm going to support her, but um, take, I don't know who, if any of you know who David Coates is, but David Coates is the retired managing um, partner of KPMG. He's in Burlington. KPMG is one of the four, the big four audit firms internationally. And when when um, Jeff Spaulding resigned as the treasurer, what David Coates said is Peter Shumlin could have appointed a political chromium. Bad word, but he could have. There were a lot of Democrats vying for that position. There were a lot of people who would like that like it. But what David said is that Peter did not do that. Instead, he went for competence. And that he applauded him for appointing Beth because she is competent. And what he said is she's just a darn good financial person. Exactly that. And so I think that we need to. Wendy Wilton has tried to politicize this position. She's tried to put Beth down by saying she's a renter instead of a homeowner. Actually, I think um, after listening to Tess Bigland, is that her name on NPR the other day about whether you should rent or buy, I think Beth is probably the smartest one of all of us by renting. But um, this is not a political position and we need to make sure that we support Beth and not Wendy Wilton. tell us a little bit about um, some other kind of some democratic history, right? That's what you're going to do. And the, while he's coming up here, I want to make a special thanks to um, Dick Guthrie, who not only has been running around here telling us all, not telling us where to go, but you know. <laughs> he, he gave me the um, pins and let me put the picture of Phil Hoff on the wall. So thank you. And Mark. Actually, I'm here as a substitute. Former Governor Tom Salmon was supposed to come and call me and said he had a conflict and wouldn't be able to be here. And the purpose of his visit was to remind everybody and when you go to vote on November 6, 2012, think back 50 years and what you did on November 6, 1962. You went and voted, hopefully, for Phil Hoff, who became our 73rd governor here in Vermont and was the first Democrat to be elected 
since John Robinson was elected in 1853. <laughs> and you know, the governor, unfortunately, is not in the best of health because he's 88 years old. I guess you can't expect someone to have the stamina and the energy that he displayed and gave us for the six years that he was governor here in Vermont. So he was unable to come down to this event. But we thought it would be a good opportunity for people to remember that this party in Wingham County is a young party. I can remember when I was in high school in the 50s, my father would go to a Democratic meeting and he used to come home and say, well, at least we had five people, so we didn't meet in the phone booth. <laughs> and this is a tribute to all of the work that all of you folks have done to build the party, to keep the party strong, and to keep the party so that we are elected Democrats. Now, Phil Hoff had a gentleman by the name of Fred Delaney, a nice man from up near Rutland, and he was the candidate for lieutenant governor. And unfortunately, Mr. Delaney was killed a month before the actual vote for lieutenant governor. So we never really had the competition for whether or not we could have had someone elected as lieutenant governor. But we all know that after that, in 1964, the Democrats swept all of the offices. And that was the first year where we had full control. And you know, a lot of us, I can see people here who had the same opportunity that I had. Bill Hoff opened up the judicial system so that all the Republicans who had served as municipal court judges were replaced by Democrats. Tom Salmon became a municipal judge. I became a municipal judge. Alvin Parker up in Springfield became a municipal judge. I mean, it, it was amazing that the nuances of the political opened up opportunities for a lot of people who had no opportunities because you were the Republicans. And I think that we ought to all think about those things because what it does is, hopefully, it encourages everyone to consider being a Democrat and to consider working for the party and working for its interests. Now, Tom Salmon has that famous saying, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, <laughs> I'm going to say, I think it's about time for me to sit down and let you folks enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. to um, the uh, staff at our headquarters uh, here in Brattleboro, uh, Joan and Diane. And I have a note that says Cass is going to be at the headquarters Thursday morning. Oh, at the marina Thursday morning, 5 to 7. And Beth, Wednesday at 3 at the headquarters. 5 to 7? Oh, in the evening. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly, uh, I, most of you probably know why we celebrate Davenport Day, but it really uh, keys off of uh, uh, what the speaker just said. And Judge Davenport was a leader in our community. Uh, I, as I understand it, he uh, founded the uh, precursor to the Brattleboro Reformer. He was an attorney, he was a judge, he was a man of stature and importance within our community. But his picture hangs in the county courthouse uh, over in New Fane. 
and there's a plaque that gives you all of this information, and then there is this sentence. He was a Democrat. Consequently, he never held political office. <laughs> it was that line, you know, Ron Squire, walking around reading plaques under pictures in the county courthouse, right? That line caught his eye, his attention, and sparked this event the first time it was held, and we've done it every election year since. particular pleasure uh, to introduce Congressman Peter Welch. Peter and I are going to go back. Um, he was uh, in the Senate. He wasn't even the leader at the time. And he and Bill Kemsley and myself and others uh, would sit and conspire about moving Vermont in terms of low-income, working, and middle-class families. I had the pleasure of serving in the Vermont Senate one term before the county woke up and said, what did we just do? And I, I lost my re-election, but in that one term, Peter was our leader. He was the speaker, uh, I'm sorry, the president pro tem. <laughs> Been in the house too long. Uh, president pro tem uh, for the Senate and provided uh, a great deal of, of, of teaching and information and mentoring to me uh, as a freshman in the Vermont Legislature. So I'm particularly pleased to introduce Peter Welsh. But if you're the Senate president or the speaker, you do. And when I come back to my office, uh, I would have one question to my assistant. And the only people that had an assistant were the speaker and the Senate president. And the question I had every time I got back was, who's mad at me now? <laughs> Jeanette, your name was mentioned quite a bit. <laughs> uh, but it's really wonderful to be here uh, with all of you. And I've told this story a lot in, in Brattleboro. You know, I grew up in Springfield, Mass, just down the road. And uh, I used to come up to Vermont uh, with my dad and my uncles when I was younger. And we'd go skiing, and my, and my dad and my uncle both liked to fish, and I never really learned how to do it. But after I got out of law school, I wanted to come to Vermont. You know, I had a chance to work on Wall Street. I had an opportunity to work on K Street, where I'd done a summer in, an internship. And I ended up on May, uh, Bridge Street in Oyster River Junction. <laughs> and I'm quite happy about it, but a couple of the people who helped me find my way are here. John Carnahan, uh, thank you, John, and Ann. <laughs> anyway, I came up in the summer and I uh, had uh, John and Ann's name from friends down in Massachusetts, and uh, they would give me some help and guidance on where to go and look for a job. And of course, Kimmy O'Connor. Uh, not just for me, but for so many of us. And I really uh, appreciate just the, the hospitality to this person that was arriving out of nowhere. There's no reason uh, to take me in or to give me advice, and you did it. It's just sort of the Wyndham County way to do it. And uh, I think it's something that says a lot about Vermont. I also want to, uh, I, I want to thank everybody here. The legislators are amazing. I've been sitting next to Toby, and I just remember working with her at my first uh, tour of duty in uh, Montpelier when I was in the state senate in the 80s. You know, I was there twice, just like Peter Shumley, who's doing a great job as governor, by the way. But I was Senate president, then I was out of office for a long time. I came back to the Senate, 
And I was gone so long that people forgot why they were mad at me and they elected me to be Senate President again. <laughs> and that's literally true for uh, Peter as well. <laughs> but in the 80s, you know, we were talking about this. This is what's so important about politics. And I'm thinking about Timmy uh, telling the history. You know, Phil Hoff 50 years ago, and of course Tom Salmon 40 years ago. And this democracy we have is so fragile. It is always uh, in jeopardy of whether we're going to maintain the kind of uh, the ties of friendship and affection and commitment and ability to look beyond ourselves down the road to protect things that are important. And when I think back in the 1980s, we, we were talking about this, when today we take for granted that we have marriage equality here in this state, we protect a woman's right to choose, that was under assault in the 1980s. And people like Toby and Ann Siebert were tough and gracious, mean when necessary, gentle when required, and they did so much to help move us along and to protect the rights of women that put us in the place that we're in today. And it's why your remarks to me, I think, are so important about what binds us together. I mean, the challenges that today are great, but they're really not different. It's just what today's challenges are. But what we're trying to do is what Phil Hoff was trying to do 50 years ago, Tom Salmon 40 years ago, Timmy when he ran for governor, when he served as uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. So it's, for me, what's so wonderful about these gatherings of people who do have a history and share a common goal that binds us together through thick and thin. Now, I'm from Washington now. <laughs> By the way, I also, you know, we brag about Peter Shumley, but, you know, the leader from Wyndham County, in my view, uh, is my campaign manager and Deputy State Director, John Copans from Brown. <laughs> Uh, but you know, a couple of people have asked me, actually more than a few, how do you like your job? And I, actually, I really like the job, but people think I need you know, a, a, a saliva test if I say that because of what's going on in Washington. It's very dysfunctional. But the reason it is right now is that so much in Washington, in the legislature, is about ideological battles rather than practical problem solving. And what is different as well is that it's not that we disagree on issues. Because you know what? There's no news in that. There's, there always will be disagreements about how you resolve a budget. What's the right energy policy? Uh, what is the right balance between civil liberties and security? These are the debates of democracy that will always occur. But what we've had in Vermont and we've enjoyed that's been so, I think, unique is that even when arguing with our Republican colleagues, they have always been for things that make a lot of sense. Small government, low taxes, and personal responsibility. But that personal responsibility embedded in it some humility. It was a recognition that it included working to create institutions that would carry on values that we thought were very important. And that institution it might be the local bank, it might be the local fire department, it might be the local Democratic or Republican Party, but there was a modesty that recognized that we're all gonna be moving on. You know, that Phil Hoff is not gonna be governor for 50 years, and Tom Salmon's gonna be there to pick it up. And in order to help him have a shot at doing it, we've gotta have a party that's gonna help him get there. Or if you're in a bank, you may be the chair, you may be a teller, but you are going to be there for a while, and your responsibility, among other things, is to make that a better institution. The new breed of Republicans don't believe in them. They don't believe in institutions. And that's why the Ryan budget is really so bad. And let me tell you why. You know, there's a lot of talk about just, quote, cutting the budget. And we know that debt is not sustainable. We know we have to deal with it. And we know that it can be dealt with if we have a balanced approach. With some revenues, the Pentagon kicks in and we figure out how to bring down health care costs. This is not rocket science. But the Ryan budget, where he has dedicated his life, he says, political life, to bringing down the debt, 
has a history where, number one, all of the things that helped get us here, he voted for, as did a lot of his colleagues. The war in Iraq on the credit card, Afghanistan on the credit card, prescription drug on the credit card, two tax cuts that were not paid for. And then when he was a senior leader, he had the ability to write a budget that would bring the debt down. And that budget made very severe cuts in healthcare, in Medicare, in scientific research, in Pell Grants. It included doubling the interest rate on Stafford loans from 3.4 to 6.8% that we were gonna charge middle class families when the government's borrowing at 1.6%. But despite those cuts, tough, tough cuts, it increases the debt of this country by six trillion dollars in the next 10 years. And of course, that's because it boosts Pentagon spending and it doubles down on these tax cuts in such a severe way that it would bring down Mitt Romney's effective tax rate to 1%. So the question is, and this is a question I've asked Paul, if your goal, and I think this is a worthy goal, is to bring the debt down, why do you present a budget that increases it by $6 trillion? The answer is that it's not about the debt, it's about the unraveling of institutions in government that we need in order to build a stronger society. The Consumer Protection Bureau, security and health care, education for our kids. We've got to have those things. And if you have an attitude that government is essentially secondary and almost irrelevant, Institutions are secondary and almost irrelevant. And essentially, institutions, as they see it, are impediments to individuals achieving their full potential. Instead of the traditional Vermont conservative point of view that I learned from folks like Bob Gannon and Art Gibb and Timmy, a lot of the folks that you work with across the aisle, where institutions require our commitment to be a partner to allow all of us together to become exactly instruments of creating a greater good. That's what's at stake in this tug of war that we're having in America. You know, we know where we stand on the energy policy. We know climate change is real and we've got to move towards renewable energy. We know that the debt's not sustainable and we have to bring it down, but it's got to be a balanced approach. We know that there should be equality uh, for people, and we've got to make a place uh, for uh, the people of color. But fundamentally, what we have to do is renew our own confidence that in order to get from here to there, we are all in it together. And that to be in it together, we have to have as an element of our commitment to personal responsibility that it includes making the institution of our choice stronger and better in something that's gonna help make a better Brattleboro, Wyndham County, Vermont, and the United States of America. That's really what's at stake in this election. This is a battle that continues. And when we go out every single day, we have to remember how much Vermont has to offer to this country, and I mean that. You know, when I think about my days in the Vermont legislature and the battles that we had with our Republican friends and oftentimes the fiercest battle were with our Democratic friends, there was always an ability to appreciate that the person you disagreed with had as a goal the same goal you had and that's to make this a better state. And we got to know each other and appreciate that whatever those differences were, that individual had kids, had setbacks, had illnesses, had aspirations, had shortcomings. And through the thick and thin, at the end of that legislative session, when we went through the disappointment of politics, you have to be, have a big heart to commit yourself to a political life because it's laden with disappointment. You never achieve your aspiration. But what you can do is aspire for, protect, for, for per, perfection, but you know the goal is progress. 
And Vermont has managed to do it. When you contrast us, our commitment to a single-payer healthcare system that's about bringing down costs so that we can have access, our commitment to renewable energy, but really our commitment to a democracy where we're all involved and we're all in it together, and the fact that we disagree with people does not mean we don't have affection for them and we don't have respect for them. So what is so wonderful for me to do this job in Washington for Vermont is that I always feel I have my wind, the wind at my back. You know, Vermonters support a problem-solving, practical approach to getting things done, not because it's mundane, it's actually quite profound. Because life is about making progress. It is about helping each of us be the better person that we all want to be. And there's something quite wonderful about doing that together rather than thinking you should be doing it alone. So Wyndham County, thank you for this evening. Thank you for all you've done over the years. And thank you for making me feel so very much at home in Brattleboro and in Wyndham County. Thank you. strongest campaign supporters, Eva, uh, to remind us that, that we also have Madeline Cunin, first go female governor of the state of Vermont, came out of our party. <laughs> one last thank you. Um, for all the time I've been doing this, I don't get it done and I don't go to Montpelier without the support of Allison. Thank you. So that um, almost brings to a close our evening. There's one person I want to especially thank who is quiet, unassuming, and operates behind the scenes but gets a whole lot of stuff done, Shirley Squires. Thank you for getting us in.